Hi everybody, I want to thank you for being willing to stop and uh, watch and listen to this video. I put out an announcement yesterday that today, uh, January 11th, 2019, I would be making a video announcement, being that this is 100 days away from April 20th. April 20th, 2019 is the day before Easter Sunday. And uh, on that day, on that, on that evening actually, Saturday evening, uh, April 20th, 2019, my family, myself, Mary Jo, and Victor, will complete a journey that we have been on for s several years, really, but, but several months very intentionally. And that journey is a journey of full reconciliation with and an entry into full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. My family and I are becoming Catholic, uh, Catholics. And um, though we've talked to many of our family and friends about this, I felt that uh, it was a good day and a good time uh, and an important time to just get the word out m more broadly. We have a lot of folks who, uh, who know us, who we love and who we care about, and we just haven't been able to sit down with everybody and, and walk through this. And so I thought a video announcement would be a great place to start. I can't go into every detail here, but I at least want to share four big ideas with you because when you hear uh, Kenny, Mary Jo, and Victor Burchard are all joining the Catholic Church, for some people that can be a huge shock uh, and you can have a lot of different kinds of emotions about that and, uh, and I get that, truly I do, um, because I've been part of these discussions for many years as a Christian and so um, I wanted to just share from our perspective what's happening with us and true to form, you know, because of my many years pastoring and, and preaching and teaching, I have four points today, and they all start with the same letter. But it's true. <laughs> uh, I want to share four words that begin with L. <laughs> really cheesy, I know, but stick with me here because it'll help me um, get through this. Four words that all start with L that will help you understand this journey that we've been on. I'll just give them all up front here. The first one is leading. The second one is learning. The third is listening. And the fourth is loving. Now I'm going to be doing a lot of reading here because I, I wrote down a lot of things that I want to say because I want to say them with precision. And sometimes when you get to talking, you say things in a way you didn't mean to exactly or you didn't use the precision you want. So if you see me reading, forgive me. It just means I want to do it right. But those four L's, uh, leading, learning, listening, and loving, will shape the rest of everything else that I say here. So the first one is leading. I said we've been on this journey very intentionally since June of 2018. Uh, to be precise, June 3rd. June 3rd is the day before my birthday, June 4th. And uh, June 3rd, my family and I went to the beach to pre-celebrate my birthday. And uh, after we were coming home from the beach, we were driving to look for food. And uh, we located a place, and as we were coming up to it, not far from where we live, I looked to the right, just as we were coming up to the shopping center, and I saw a church building that I hadn't ever really paid attention to before. And I looked at it, and I saw the sign outside the church building, and it said, St. John the Apostle Catholic Church. And I thought, oh, I, I didn't remember that there was a Catholic church in this neighborhood. Well, that's cool. And then, at that exact moment, as I was having that thought, I had what Catholics would call a locution. Pentecostals would call it a word from the Lord. And uh, so I had a, a locution as I'm sitting in my car, and it, it went like this. Go in there. That's it. Go in there. And I didn't go in there. I went out for pizza and beer with my family. But as I was sitting there drinking beer and eating pizza, I was thinking, I think that was the Lord that told me to go to that church. I think I'm supposed to go to that church. And I thought about it all day, uh, that whole day. And I went into uh, uh, our office at home and Googled the church website and just looked around it for a while. And I thought, yeah, this is the Lord. So I came out into the living room, my wife sitting on the couch, and I said, Joe, did you see the Catholic church that we drove by just before we got to the uh, pub uh, coming home from the beach? And she said, yeah, I think I did see that. And I said, well, I think the, the Lord 
told me that I need to go attend a worship service at that church. And she said, I want to go. <laughs> so I was like, uh, really? So the next Saturday night, which would, I believe, be June 9th, I have to check my date on that, we went to the Saturday evening vigil mass uh, at St. John the Apostle Catholic Church. Now, I've been to a few masses over the course of my life. I always loved them, but I admittedly didn't really understand everything that was going on. Some of it I did and, and loved, and other pieces of it I thought, this is just foreign to me. I don't. It, it's beautiful, but I don't understand it, and I don't get the rationale behind it. But because I was there that first time feeling very much like the Holy Spirit wanted me to be there, I was trying to pay attention in ways that I never had before when I had gone, for instance, to a wedding or at the invitation of a friend or something like that. At this Mass, I was locked in. I was like, what are you, why am I here, Lord? What are you trying to say? Why are we at Mass at St. John the Apostle Catholic Church? And some things really came in and stuck to me, but I honestly walked away just feeling like I need some help with this. And one of my friends, a dear old, old friend from Hanford, uh, found out that I had gone to this uh, worship gathering, this Mass, and he recommended that I read a book by Scott Hahn called The Lamb's Supper. Scott Hahn, H-A-H-N. Uh, and so for the next four days, I read this book by Scott Hahn, The Lamb's Supper, in which he explains what the Mass is, what the Catholic Mass is. Very different from a Protestant worship gathering in every way and for every reason. And so as I read this book, I felt myself being pulled even harder into wanting to go back. And the next Saturday night, we went back again. This time I had the Lamb Supper lenses on that I got from Scott Hahn. And it was like a whole new world for me. It was like those videos you see where people have been colorblind and then they put on those glasses and they cry because they can finally see what was always right in front of them the whole time, but they couldn't detect it because of the lenses they were wearing. And I'm, I'm in the mass and I am pulled into it in a way that I had never experienced before in my whole life. And I had been through... Uh, and part of many liturgies, not, not just Catholic liturgies, but for many months, um, Anglican liturgies and some Episcopal liturgy and other things, and, and always loved it, but didn't really understand the structure of it and the purpose for it. And then, having gone back a second time with these lenses on, I found myself pulled in to the Catholic Church in a whole new way, and I just felt like Okay, something's happening here. So that, that first L was this locution, this leading of the Holy Spirit. Go there, go to church, go to a church service there. And I decided, my wife and I and, and my son decided that we would um, follow this. And we would enter into what we called a journey of discernment, uh, where we would pay attention. And uh, the first stage of that really is the second L of the four that I want to share, and that's the learning. We decided that part of our discernment process, in order to really listen to the Lord during this season, we needed to learn. Uh, we needed to learn what the Catholic te Church teaches from Catholic authorities. Learn what the Catholic Church teaches from Catholic authorities. If you were part of our church, you heard me, a non-Catholic authority, Protestant, Pentecostal, evangelical pastor, tell you uh, what the Catholic Church believes and what it means by what it says. And I'm no Catholic authority, ne never was. And so I'm not the person to learn about Catholicism from, uh, or from which, or from whom you should learn about Catholicism. We decided to learn about Catholicism from Catholics, in specific from the Catholic authorities. And that meant that we had to engage this, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is what the Catholic Church teaches. And so this has become a conversation partner, a, a, uh, a, something that we engage with daily and that we have learned to, to um, listen to. So we needed to learn from the churches, the Catholic Church's teaching authority. Um, we've had to read the Catechism. We've had to read the Church Fathers. 
We've had to read books by Catholic theologians and biblical scholars in the Catholic Church's magisterium. People like Joseph Ratzinger, who you would know as Pope Benedict XVI. And this is arguably one of the greatest and most influential theologians and biblical scholars in any tradition alive today, and, and certainly in the 20th century up to the present time. Over the course of this learning part of our discernment, um, I have read thousands of pages by these men and women. I have listened to scores of hours of teaching and lectures by them on everything from the canon law of the Catholic Church to Catholic dogmatic theology to the catechism to historical theology to Catholic epistemology, all of, all of these ologies that every system has. And I have let Catholic people, Catholic scholars who do theology the Catholic way, tell me what Catholics actually believe. And um, so as a family, this has been something that we've been doing. And we've also been together in a process called RCIA, the Rite of Christian, uh, Christian Initiation of Adults. And um, this is where we are learning what the Catholic Church teaches from a Catholic pr perspective. Our whole family is going through this with a whole other group of people. And uh, now please be assured uh, that there were a lot of questions that I had. I wrote down my own list of 14 points of theological reconciliation that I would need to resolve before I could ever consider being a Catholic. Uh, these were, for me, these were the deal breakers, uh, you might say. Um, and some of you are wondering if I really did a good job here. Like, did he really uh, think about all this stuff? Like, did, did he look at um, Mary, what the Catholic Church teaches about Mary? Does he know that Catholics believe in something called purgatory? Does he know that Catholics have a pope? Does he know that they believe in a celibate priesthood? Um, does Kenny know that the Catholic Church is not sola scriptura? Does, uh, does Kenny know all this? Does he, he understand the word indulgences? Um, truly, surely, Kenny hasn't thought of all these things or he would never be becoming a Catholic. Um, I, I just want to tell you, those are all the things that were on my list, and more. And I had to go through, my family had to go through, and still continues to go through, a journey of interactive dialogue with the authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church on these issues. Listening to the Catholic Church, you could say, with Catholic ears, even though we have Protestant ears, we've had to learn how to listen through Catholic ears, and that's been really helpful to us. And so this first uh, part of our discernment process was where we, we just had to learn what Catholics mean by the things that they say and what they're trying to communicate with the words that they use, which many of them are similar or even the same words to what Protestants use, but mean very different things by them. And so the second L is learning. We've been learning from the Catholic Church, what the Catholic Church actually teaches. If you want to go on Google and Google uh, bad things Catholic believe, Catholics believe, you'll hear from all the people who aren't Catholics or who are ex-Catholics or whatever, and they'll, and they'll tell you, we've decided to listen to the Catholic Church tell us what they believe. And that's been really helpful, and that's the second L, learning from the Catholic Church what the Catholic Church actually teaches about things. The third L, only two more, is listening. Uh, this for me has been one of the most fulfilling parts of the journey. Uh, I have been listening to the stories of people who are honestly like me and like my family. And specifically what I mean by that is I have been listening to through their books and through their lectures and through their, you know, their website content and everything else formerly Protestant, evangelical, seminary-trained, ordained ministers, missionaries, clergy, uh, people who were in that strand of Protestant Christianity who became Catholic, um, not despite their training, 
not despite all the things that they knew and learned and understood and participated in, but in many ways because of those things. They paused like we're pausing and said, maybe we should let the Catholic Church speak for itself. And they found what they were looking for. And so there are so many of these, these books out there. The first one that I read was by the guy whose book I read that I referenced earlier, Scott Hahn, his book, Rome Sweet Home. Kind of a corny title, but a really great book in which he details his journey from being a seminary-trained Protestant uh, evangelical pastor, ordained minister for decades, and then coming in to the Roman Catholic Church. I read, I read his journey, and that just put me on the path of, of reading many more uh, books by guys such as G.K. Chesterton, who you might have heard of, Scott Hahn, I already mentioned, uh, Peter Kreeft, who was known for so many years as a Protestant evangelical Christian apologist who became a Roman Catholic, Francis Beckwith, who came back to the Catholic Church, to be fair, but he was the president of the Evangelical Theological Society, and while he was in that position, the Holy Spirit called him back into uh, a full reconciliation with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Thomas Merton, Malcolm Muggeridge, one of my favorite Jesus guys, the late Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, David Curie, Thomas Howard, just to name a few of these guys, their books and their stories for me, have become like going into a room full of guys that think like I think, that process the way I process, that um, have the same concerns that I had, had some of the similar life experiences that I had, who all felt drawn into the Roman Catholic Church, who all share the entire process of their journey. So it's been this huge comfort for me to have these uh, dialogue partners through their books and writings and so forth. I've been listening to them. In a sense, they've been like mentors to me. Um, they not only helped me to understand how to process a lot of the relational stuff, but also a lot of the theological stuff too, because that is hugely important to me and always will be. So leading of the Holy Spirit, learning from the Catholic Church what they believe from their own lips, listening to people like me and my family who had similar life experiences, uh, listening to how they have made this journey. And then the fourth thing, and we're coming in for a landing here, is loving the Roman Catholic Church. And that, just saying, I love the Roman Catholic Church, for some people, this will create such a visceral, emotional response. You won't know what to do with it. Maybe because of your own experience as a Catholic, or maybe because you like me, read about the horrors of clergy sexual abuse on the news every night and your stomach turns because of it. And you wonder how in the world can Kenny and Mary Jo and Victor say that they love that? How can you love the Roman Catholic Church? Um, the reason is because I've opened my heart to love the Roman Catholic Church. I have allowed myself, I've tried to allow myself to feel toward the church the way Jesus says he feels toward the church in the book of Ephesians, in which he says he loved the church and gave himself up for it, uh, washing it by water with the word, that he might present to himself a pure and chaste bride having neither spot nor wrinkle nor any such blemish, which says that the church uh, before this process has got some spots and wrinkles and blemishes that Jesus is cleansing and needs to cleanse. And trust me when I tell you that I love the Roman Catholic Church, but I do see the spots and wrinkles and blemishes. I'm not blind to them. And I also want you to know that I will then become a reason. My family will become a reason why the church has even more spots and wrinkles and blemishes that Jesus is going to need to cleanse out of our lives because we don't come into the church as perfect people wishing that everybody else would get their act together. We come in needing Jesus to cleanse us just like the entire church needs Jesus to cleanse it. And, but we're not doing that from the outside anymore. We're doing it from the inside uh, of, of the church. So I am, my family is, joining an army of faithful Catholics who do not want to nail 
the problems that the church has to the outside door of the church uh, in protest, but rather we are going in to be worked on ourselves and to work on these things from the inside. Uh, so the, the bottom line for our church is we're becoming Catholic because we have fallen in love with the church. We have fallen in love with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we see the blemishes, but we also see the beauty. I want to read a, a quote by G.K. Chesterton here. It says, uh, It is impossible to be just to the Catholic Church. The moment a man ceases to pull against it, he feels a tug towards it. The moment he ceases to shout it down, he begins to listen to it with pleasure. The moment he tries to be fair to it, he begins to be fond of it. And that is what happened to me and my family. We, as a family, have ended our protest against the Catholic Church. We were born into this protest that we did not start. We have been expected, in so many ways, to keep that protest going. And we, for our part, decided to stop protesting to put down our guard, to open our hearts, and to become part of the Catholic Church. We are not converting to Catholicism. We are going in already as Christians. We are not getting rebaptized. The Catholic Church considered us Christians when we show, showed up on the doorstep before we ever came around, which would be different from many Protestant churches that would want to rebaptize you if you came in as a Catholic. Rather, we are reconciling. We are entering into full communion with the 2019-year-old Catholic Church. Another quote by G.K. Chesterton that means a lot to me here. Um, quote, The difficulty of explaining why I am Catholic is that there are 10,000 reasons, all amounting to one reason, that the that Catholicism is true, close quote. And that doesn't mean that everything I ever heard before this moment isn't true. Rather, at this point in time, for us, there's a convergence, if I can use a word, there is the Catholicizing, the bringing of all the parts together into one whole, all of the truth that we have known and loved and lived by and learned over the course of our lives. One of the books that I read was by a guy named Paul Whitcomb, who was also a uh, person who was in Christian ministry before becoming Catholic. He says this, and this is a very meaningful quote to me. I'm speaking to those people uh, in our circles who are, remain in the Protestant traditions. I'm going to quote Paul Whitcomb here. This is important. Quote, my association with Protestantism did me a great deal of good. It was, as a Protestant, that I learned the reality and power and munificent goodness of God. It was, as a Protestant, that I learned of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, come into the world to atone for the sins of man and lead man in the way of eternal salvation, it was as a Protestant that I learned to acknowledge and revere the Bible as the holy word of God. And it was as a Protestant that I came to know many wonderful God-fearing people, people whose sincerity and genuine Christian charity were a great source of inspiration to me. It would be deceitful and most ungrateful for me to deny that I benefited from my long association with Protestantism. In all Christian truthfulness, I must admit that those were good days, and I still feel a very pleasant nostalgia whenever they are called to memory. However, be that as it may, I had to make a change. In conscience, I had to become a Catholic, close quote. So in other words, after 33 years, and for my wife it's been her whole life, my son since he's been with us, 
after all those years of being real Christians, actual Christians, after 20 of those 33 years of being in full-time vocational ministry, ordained, preaching, teaching, leading churches, after teaching through 10 entire books of the Bible, verse by verse, covering thousands of verses, hundreds of hours, after three years of graduate school in New Testament biblical scholarship, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by learning what the Catholic Church actually means by what it says, by listening to what others like me and my family have gone through on their own journey, and by ultimately coming to love what we have found in the Catholic Church, we conclude that the Catholic Church is telling us the truth about reality the best we've ever heard it told. It is giving us a coherent worldview. Jet going over, by the way. It is giving us a coherent worldview regarding how we come to know the truth, regarding God's purposes for the world, regarding what's actually gone wrong with the world, regarding what God has done, is doing, and will do about what's gone wrong with the world, and regarding the ultimate future that God has in store for this world. The Catholic Church, we conclude, is telling us the truth, the best we've ever heard it told, about all of those things. And so I'll end with this, especially in case some of you who are listening are wondering, is Kenny and, and Mary Jo, or are Kenny and Mary Jo and Victor still Christians now that they've become Catholic? Uh, yeah, I need to end with this. In response to that question, I want to end with words that have been spoken for hundreds of years on the lips of Catholics in every imaginable language, in every imaginable place, every day. I end with this quote. You'll, you'll know it and be familiar with it. This is an answer to the question, is, is the Burchard family still following Jesus? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. There's more to say and more to tell, but those are the big pieces. And I want to thank you all for any who stopped to listen to this, especially if you listened to it all the way through. I realized that it was kind of long, but a, a big thing like this requires a good response and a good answer. And hopefully we've given the big pieces in a way that you can... Um, can hear and grapple with and understand and appreciate. We love you all. We thank you. We bless you. Stay tuned for more. We'll continue talking about our journey, but here we are. We're becoming Catholic. God bless you from us. Have a beautiful day.